Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips, tricks and time management related to this examination. As a part of this particular tutorial, we are stepping into the chapter 5 of course and uh, offset C and shall be looking forward to add more value by covering other related questions from this particular chapter as it plays a very vital role in your examination. Let's move on to the next one and the next question we have is question number 33. It says, uh, what does the test pyramid model show? What does the test pyramid model show? So we remember that uh, pyramid example which certainly have uh, you know representation of two important things at each level that is the number of test cases and the amount of automation so at the lower part of the pyramid we say that uh, we try to do more and more tests and 100 percent automation which basically represents that unit test are we we are talking about so and same way as we gradually move to the next levels the size of the pyramid goes down that means as we move to the later uh, levels like acceptance test, we will have minimum test cases and uh, sometimes they are completely manual as well. So the major representation of the test pyramid explains us that where we write more detailed test cases and more and more test cases and high automation. So effort on two important things. So let's quickly look at the options which would give us the right answer. So option A says the test may have different priorities. So again, priorities are important but uh, the point is test pyramid does not deal with the prioritization. I can certainly run any of the tests based on my overall flow, determination of what to be run at unit level, what to be run at integration level, but pyramid does not talk about that. If I look at the option B, option B says the test uh, may have different granularity. Granularity is a very technical word which talks about the concreteness of a test. That means granularity. It certainly talks about writing more and more number of test cases. But when I say coarser and finer, two important words, right, under granularity. If I say granularity is coarse, that means high level test cases. If I say granularity is fine, that means very small and many of them. Okay, so coarser and finer basically determines. So yes, exactly the pyramid talks about granularity of the test. If I talk about option C, option C says that test may require different coverage criteria. And that's a very common part of our entire test process. That means uh, if you're doing unit testing, integration test or system test, any such level uh, would have a coverage criteria to be measured or sometime as a part of exit criteria to determine the effectiveness of our testing. But again, test pyramid does not have something to define there. It mainly talks about two things. That is the uh, level details of the test cases, that is concreteness and the amount of automation. So let's keep it straightforward. Okay, the option D says the test may depend on the other test. That's again generic, nothing to do specifically with test pyramid. Test pyramid is not the thing which defined it. See, you may say that these all the four things are very important for testing. Why not? That's true. But the point is, is this the ask? Is this what the test pyramid gave you? Answer is no. That's it. We were supposed to find what is relevant to that of the testing pyramid. Okay, so in that context put together, the right answer for this particular question is B that the tests may have different granularity which is certainly represented and displayed by the test pyramid model okay so let's move on to the next question the next question we have is with question number 34 and this is talking about next part of it which is the test quadrants uh, of the uh, pyramids so what is the relationship between the quadrant the test level and the test time interesting one because uh, we have been through all the four quadrant details and we know there we have discussed about the uh, levels and we have discussed about the types as well. However, we did not particularly say white box and black box anywhere in any of the quadrant, but we told you which is fully automated, which can be partially manual or automated, which can be fully manual and you know, what does it face uh, like technology facing and what does it support like to take the product or supports the team, etc. So these are the four elements what we take care of. So let's look at the options because option can only help us to get to the right answer in this case. Option A says testing quadrants represents particular combination of test levels and test types defining their location in the software development lifecycle. 
The most important thing here is, yes, testing quadrants groups the test level and test types according to multiple criteria. But at any point in this entire segment, we did not discuss that it tells us where exactly to be executed as a part of SDLC. Okay, so it does not tell me the position. It does not tell me the alignment of what to be executed when. But yes, it does group things. Like for example, quadrant one talks about component testing and component integration testing. Quadrant four talks about non-functional testing. But it does not tell me at what point in the SDLC it should be executed. So that line in the second part is not correct. So the second point, uh, second part of this particular option says clearly that defining their location in the SDLC, which is not true. Let's go to option B. Option C says, uh, option B says testing quadrant describes the degree of granularity of individual test types performed at each test level. I think that's what we just covered in the previous question. So we don't have to really uh, invest a lot of our time. Uh, it test, test pyramid is the context which talks about the granularity, whereas uh, the quadrant talks about grouping with a particular objective of the test levels uh, along with their uh, amount of automation or manual. Let's move to option C. Option C says testing quadrants assign the test types that can be performed to the uh, specific test levels. Uh, looks very interesting statement because statement is not correct, but most of us would think that it is right. The reason why it is not correct is general test, any test type can be performed at any test level. Okay. If you remember from the chapter two, we clearly told you that uh, any of the four things that is functional, non-functional, black box, white box can be conducted at any test level. You have a doubt, go back to chapter two, check the section 2.3 and you will have the clarity, okay? That is test types. You should look into test types and uh, you will read this line. And as far as this line is clear, I don't really have to justify myself. Let's move on to option D. Option D says testing quadrant group test levels and test types by several criteria, such as targeting specific stakeholder. Now, if I compare the four options given to me here, D makes more sense than any other three options, okay? Because yes, we do group it, but not just on a particular criteria, like specific, it's on multiple criteria, and it does talk about how does it fulfill the needs of the stakeholder, like internally, we first conduct quadrant one and two, which supports the team, quadrant three and four will critique the product, which one is technology facing, which one is uh, kind of like business facing. So all that are my different set of criteria. So keeping it straightforward, the right answer for this particular question is, D, that is testing quadrants group, test levels and test types by several criteria, such as targeting specific stakeholders. So team, if you have any confusion at any point of time, because if you heard the video in one go, then rewind it, re-listen to the justifications to fit that into your mind, because that is what is important to get the proper justification and satisfaction that yes, I understood what exactly he meant. Right? That is more important because I'm not the one who's writing the examination. It's you who's going to write the examination. So your understanding is very important. Okay, let's move on to the next question. The next question we have is question number 35. And uh, this is talking about the risk. Which of the following is an example of how product risk analysis may influence the thoroughness and scope of testing? Uh, first of all, this is the most critical statement to be understood by any testers from the risk management that yes, risk analysis is a process which determines the amount of testing, the prioritization and many other things which the testing team follows based on the identified and determined level of risk. So yes, a product risk analysis gives us the detail of the risk and based on that assess details, we define on how much testing to be done, how many more test cases to write. Uh, when to execute it, when to prioritize it, etc. So let's look at the option, what they are trying to say. Option A says continuous risk monitoring allows us to identify emerging risk as soon as possible. Okay, that's a great thing. Uh, of course, just monitoring uh, uh, does that job. But point is, it's not a part of the risk product risk analysis, like the initial part. It's a part of risk control, right? You see two segments. Uh, risk control, uh, risk analysis talks about uh, identification and assessment and risk control talks about mitigation and monitoring. So sometimes that classification could help you bring back that highlight why the option A is not correct. 
otherwise as a very beautiful option very beautiful option to get distracted to okay let's move on to option b option b says risk identification allows us to implement risk mitigation activities and reduce the risk level I, I, of course uh, i'm sure you know that it's not me who should tell you that risk identification alone cannot determine that post identification we have to conduct assessment where we determine the impact and likelihood and based on that we determine the level of risk finally having level of risk we can talk about what to be done for mitigating it and how much to be done for that so risk identification alone cannot do that so just quoting one keyword under product risk analysis that you're talking about risk identification is not the op only option which is uh, defining or influencing the thoroughness and scope of testing it's risk assessment as well option c says the assessed risk level helps us to select the rigors of testing rigor of testing basically means the amount of testing to be conducted or detail of testing to be conducted and yes it's the risk level now why they just use risk level the reason is risk level comes from uh, likelihood and impact and likelihood and impact are measured in risk assessment and risk assessment cannot happen without identification that means by just using one word they told you the entire sequence to be followed in order to define the amount of testing to be done okay looks relevant let's move to option d option d says uh, risk analysis allows us to derive coverage items uh, risk analysis coverage items can can be derived using test techniques not the risk analysis because see when we talk about coverage items uh, we do talk about uh, things which needs to be tested so i'm not talking about tested here i'm talking about writing those test cases which helps me mitigate the test cases sorry mitigate the risk okay so it's completely related to risk coverage item not the test coverage item okay because for test coverage in the test design phase you are writing them generally but after doing risk analysis you are writing additional test cases on top of your basic test coverage which is for risk coverage not for the test coverage and that makes it simple and clear that the right answer for this particular question is c that is assessed risk level helps us to select the rigor of testing which means the amount and deep dive of the testing to be conducted which will be determined by the risk level indirectly they told you that how will you reach to risk level it's not the first step you will perform everything else what is required to be done there in order to do so right so that's how sometimes it could be a very indirect statement which could be right answer but some direct questions or direct statements may not be relevant at all so have your patience read them understand them and then conclude that's all from this particular tutorial team should you have anything else feel free to comment below i'm always there to address your queries and answer them well till then keep learning keep exploring keep understand the context Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.